Okay, so hello everyone. What we have here is a very rare book from the Wilbur Rare Book Library at Star King School for the Ministry in Berkeley. Uh, Wilbur was the first historian uh, of the Unitarian side of our religious tradition. Uh, he worked on the, his history for about 40 years. He traveled all over Europe, bought up a huge collection of rare books, and this is among the rarest. This is a Latin translation of um, the Rakovian Catechism, which was a, uh, a statement of faith developed by the Polish Brethren in Poland in the beginning in the 1560s. They were the founders of the oldest or the, the earliest anti-Trinitarian congregations anywhere in Europe. And after about 40 years of existence, they pulled together their beliefs, their basic uh, religious convictions, and uh, put them into this catechism. It was originally published in 1605 in Polish, but unless you were in Poland, nobody knew Polish. So this Latin translation really became the uh, primary scholarly translation that spread all over Europe because at that time Latin was the that Latin was the major scholarly language. Uh, it bore a dedication to King James II of England and they thought he would be honored. Instead he read a few pages, declared it an abomination and ordered all the copies burnt. So for that reason alone it's even more rare than it might otherwise might be. The Polish Brethren uh, emerged as a dissident group from within the Polish Calvinist Church beginning in the late 1550s. We know about Transylvanian Unitarianism today mostly because the Transylvanian uh, churches managed to continue to exist and as you know they continue to exist today. The Polish churches had a more woeful fate. They were pretty much stomped out by the Catholic Counter-Reformation and after 1660 they ceased to exist. But while they did exist, they had an academy at which they educated a huge number of uh, uh, young noblemen and some commoners. They had a printing press of which this is a, a primary example, but they, they churned out a huge amount of liberal religious literature that spread all over Europe. And uh, it was, of course, widely attacked because it denied the conventional doctrine of the Trinity. It denied the uh, practice of infant baptism, uh, substituting adult baptism in its place as a, a mark of adult choice to join the church. But this book spread to Holland, it spread to England, uh, was very influential in the English Unitarian movement and to some extent in the liberal religious movements in Holland which by 1620 and 1630 were rather diverse. It included traditional Calvinists, some Catholics, some very liberal groups like the Remonstrants and the Collegians who were very influenced by this book and others like it. And so this this book really is a, uh, a milestone in liberal and liberalizing religious literature in the, what we might call the middle years of the Protestant Reformation. Remember that the Reformation began back in 1517 with Martin Luther and it didn't really get to Poland in a major way in about the 1540s and within a decade this unorthodox group that called themselves eventually the Polish Brethren began to uh, preach their ideas within the Calvinist churches and then of course that eventually caused a split and uh, they uh, after 1565 went their own separate ways and uh, and were known as the Polish Minor Reformed Church, but they called themselves mostly the Polish Brethren. And they flourished roughly from 1570 to about 1640, about a period of 70 years. Uh, and this is certainly one of the fruits of their work.
Uh, they had an intellectual center in the little town of Rockhoof, which was founded as the only Unitarian town in history, as far as I know. They didn't use the word Unitarian at that time, but they were the ancestors of our modern uh, Unitarian thought. They denied the special divinity of Jesus. They believed in Jesus' human nature. Early on, they did believe in the virgin birth, but later on, they discarded that belief. And uh, they believed in human free will, which meant no predestination, as Calvin had uh, preached. It meant uh, that the future is open because human beings and other creatures have free will. It means the future is not settled. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen because what's going to happen is the result of decisions of freely choosing creatures. So that meant that God didn't know the future either. God knew, God, in their theology, God knew everything there was to be known, but the future was not among the things to be known because it hadn't happened yet. Uh, so, so God was not in control in that sense, freely cho choosing creatures like human beings and, and, uh, and to a lesser extent other animals had the freedom to, uh, to shape what the future was going to be. And some of those ideas were embodied in this book, the Rokovian Catechism. And later on, a couple of decades later in 1630, even more radical theological ideas were developed uh, afterwards. You may have come across the word Socinian or Socinianism because in, in 1580, an Italian immigrant named Fausto Socini moved to Poland settled among the Polish brethren and became their leader. He was a brilliant and innovative theologian. He was a great church organizer, a good combination, and he was so influential among the Polish brethren that outside of Poland, people referred to them as Socinians after Socini's name. So you may you may hear Socinianism referred to in in Unitarian, the Unitarian side of our history, but it refers that to the Polish brethren. Uh, they were in constant contact with the Transylvanian uh, liberal movement, uh, but the Transylvanians uh, after 1571 had to kind of hunker down to protect themselves, whereas in Poland the Polish brethren had the support and protection of the nobility and so for many decades they were able to openly exercise their religion without uh, too much fear of persecution. It was only when the Catholic uh, counter-reformation got more strongly underway in Poland that they were eventually, that the Polish brethren were eventually suppressed and eventually exiled. So we have this testimony, uh, many, one, one volume among many, that is the legacy of the Polish brethren to our Unitarian Universalism today and many of the ideas that in seminal form uh, appeared in this catechism are still influential in Unitarian Universalist thinking today. So we're grateful to Earl Morris Wilbur for having assembled this wonderful collection of books and uh, if you're ever in Berkeley and want to come by Star King, I'm sure that you will be able to take a look at the fabulous uh, book collection. Here's just a, a photo of uh, a, just a bit of the shelf of 1,300 volumes that Wilbur collected over the course of his 40-year research. So thank you for listening, and uh, uh, I hope this has piqued your interest in uh, the Unitarian side of our UU history. Thank <laughs> you.